We have thousands and thousands of developers at a company like Facebook. And there's a lot of things that start breaking when you get to that scale. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today's video is definitely a little different. First of all, you don't see my desktop. You don't see Xcode. And as a special treat, we've got a fellow mobile developer who is working at Facebook. And we have the opportunity to pick his brain, talk tech, talk content creation, the differences as to why iOS is better. Kidding, kidding. But get into the weeds of all the hard-hitting questions that we get in the comments daily. So uh, Rahul, take it away to introduce yourself. You can probably do a much better job than what I'm going to do justice for you. No, I appreciate the, the intro, Frost. Thanks so much for having me. I am currently at Facebook, like you mentioned. I have been doing Android now for quite a while. And I also have a YouTube channel where I focus on Android content. So um, in terms of intro, yeah, I started off at Stanford. I went to a startup. That startup got acquired by Pinterest. Pinterest to three years there, and then Pinterest to Facebook, which is where I've been for about four years now. Um, and then on the side, I have the YouTube channel, like I mentioned. And then also I have a community called Tech Career Growth, which maybe we'll touch on a little bit later. But that community is basically trying to help people, whether you're Android, iOS, web, or any other kind of engineer, how can you break into tech and how, you, how can you advance your career in tech faster? So you're an Android engineer. Can you speak a little as to, you know, why Android? Uh, you know, how did you get in, involved in Android? Like, we've got a lot of people here that are very, very big on iOS, diehard Apple fanboys, if I will. So uh, sp speak to the greater audience. So why, why do we have Android discussions going on today? Yeah, well, I think at a meta level, I think it is valuable to have a conversation between me and you as an Android and iOS developer, because a lot of people kind of pick something and they're very myopic and like, I'm going to do this one thing for the next, I don't know, five, 10, whatever number of years. But it is actually worth thinking about what are the other career paths available to me. And even if you don't decide to like switch over tomorrow to be an Android developer, although I would love that if you did, I think it's still valuable to like peek at the other platform and understand, hey, what are the good and bad parts about how they're designing UI? How are they making network calls? Like all these different architecture questions, because that will actually make you a better iOS developer. So I feel like there's value from that perspective. Um, and then in terms of my journey, uh, I have always had an Android phone. I think that was kind of the initial push to me becoming an Android developer. And I think if I think back to like when I first got my smartphone, it was like junior year, my third year of university. Um, and honestly, I think it was because it was cheaper. <laughs> like I am money conscious. My family is like, you know, we always trying to look for deals and things. So I feel like that was really why I got an Android phone. And since I've always had an Android phone, um, it was kind of a natural thing to become an Android developer, even right. though almost all the companies I've worked at or all the companies I've worked at, they're very iOS dominant in the sense that all the employees at the companies, um, they're almost all iOS developers um, mm. to the point where like the company would have to encourage people to say, hey, please don't use iOS. We really need more people to test out the Android app. And so I felt like I was kind of uniquely qualified to have an opinion about what does the Android app look and feel like because I was one of those rare Android people. And then the final component was mentorship. I just felt like at Pinterest in particular, there was a team of people who I thought were really supportive and one tech lead in particular who I thought um, could really give me some guidance. And I feel like I tell this to people a lot. I actually don't care really what technology you pick. What's more important is do you have the support system around you to help you get unstuck? to like give you motivation or guidance because programming is not an endeavor that you do in isolation. I mean, it shouldn't be, especially in these big companies, you're gonna be working with people. And so if you have someone who's really good at web, for example, or iOS and pick that because that will be the big driver to help you get further in your career. Yeah, yeah, no, mentorship is definitely key. Definitely a team sport as much as people would like to be the MVP of every single project. Yeah. Doesn't end up working out that way, but no, super interesting. Uh, so you mentioned that you kind of fell into the Android ecosystem or continued into it as a virtue of picking up an Android device uh, earlier on, which is interesting because that's kind of how it went for me too. If I really think about it, I think I always had an appeal for iOS and like shiny Apple products they're, you know, super clean ads. Some people think they're a little pretentious, but I think they're particularly clean. But yeah, I remember getting an, an iPod Touch. Um, and I remember when the App Store was introduced. And uh, it's, it's, you know, I think it's by virtue of, I did think it was cool, but I had an iOS device at my disposal. And had I had like an Android device, 
I probably would be working in an Android studio these days. Yeah. And, you know, this would be Android Academy. And actually, so, it's interesting, interesting. Like, I, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you actually started iOS not within a large company where you had this kind of mentorship or team yeah. environment. I think you started on your own, right? So, yeah. um, like, what was your initial motivation? Like, I want to publish an app or was it more like, what was something else? So honestly, uh, for me, starting iOS, it was right place, right time. My initial motivation was, I would say, part interest of like, what is this new thing? Everyone's getting an iPod touch. Hmm. And, and, and part of it was, uh, you know, in-app purchases weren't that big back then, these microtransactions. What was bigger was creating an app and selling it for a few bucks, two, three dollars. I even remember when apps were like $9.99, which is like unheard of nowadays, unless it's like a big enterprise bundle. But uh, I mean, pretty transparently for me, it was interest and it was it was a thought of, hey, this is a pretty good way to, you know, not work a retail job and make a couple bucks on the side as, you know, this like kid from my room in a laptop, no idea what I was doing. Swift wasn't a thing at that point. There were no tutorials. If there were, they were, you know, very, uh, very much so in short supply. So it was just kind of in the weeds of like taking taking a look at what is this new thing that Apple is is building, and you know there were so many skeptics of of the iPhone back then, and uh, you know iPod touches, and it was just such a new novel thing. And now apps are just this like big standard. Like everyone and their mom has an app idea. There's these YouTube channels, and you know it's it's grown a lot. It's matured a lot over the past man like 12, 12 years, thirteen years. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, that's an interesting um, way of looking at it, because I feel like what, what I'm hearing from you is that a motivation to get into iOS is that the path to actually getting revenue, like a meaningful amount of money from you, your users, is actually way, way easier on iOS compared to Android, yeah. because typically, you know, the average, in, the average iOS user is going to make a lot more money and be much more willing to spend that money, right? Yeah. Um, and I think for me, like, I, that was not at all on my radar because you know mm-hmm. I went to I was like in the middle of Silicon Valley I went to Stanford and all yep. my peers they were like landing jobs after graduation who were paying <laughs> more than a hundred thousand dollars and so like for my peer group it was much more about like rather than spending a bunch of time on an app which may or may not make I don't know a thousand two thousand mm-hmm. dollars it's much better to just optimize for landing that job and then you can either pick Android iOS so like that factor of like you know revenue generation didn't play into my uh, you know, decision at all. You, you touched on an interesting concept of, uh, you know, revenue differences and usage differences. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on just like the platform and how Google handles the Play Store and how developers are treated. And hopefully I can shed some light in terms of iOS. I remember, so just some context, I, I've, I've written an Android app before, a few of them. They're pretty bad, admittedly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, going through the concepts of, you know, the Play Store and, and like a and R's, I don't remember what those even stand for right now, and rollouts, it's very different than iOS. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I'm actually in the same boat. I have written one and a half iOS apps. If I showed <laughs> them to you, you'd probably laugh at me, like how bad they are. Um, but yeah, so I think it's nice that we have like a little bit of a sense of the other platform. But I think it's so interesting how Google and Apple are the dominant company. Like they are the only companies that have a, a thriving mobile ecosystem. Yep. But the way they approach their attitude toward, toward developers and developing the actual OS is so different, right? Like Google is wide open, open ecosystem. They develop Android, the open source project out in the open, right? It's open source. Yeah. On the other hand, iOS is developed completely in secret. Even people at Apple, like aside from a couple dozen people, I imagine, yeah. no one even at Apple knows what's going to happen in the next version of iOS. And I think that kind of mentality or culture manifests in how third-party developers like me and you, how we interact with the platform. Like I think yep. Google Play, they really value quick iteration speed and a lot of app diversity in the Play Store. Like the process to submit an app is super easy. Um, it's also cheap. Like it's a $25 one-time fee to, yep. to be a developer and then you're a developer for life, right? So you can publish as many apps as you want. And the review process is like maybe a couple days and then every iterative update is like a couple hours and you're out to the whole world. Yep. On the other hand, my experience with Apple was so painful where like, I submitted the app. It took like a week and a half or a week to like, get an initial review and they they like rejected my app two or three times for stupid reasons it's like oh you know like you don't have a user reporting i mean user reporting is is valuable i don't want to yeah you know discount that but like things that you know like i felt like didn't need to be part of the mvp or the initial launch they would reject reject the app and so it was a much more um slow process and it's also more expensive right it's a hundred dollars a year i think yep for every year that you want to be a developer so yeah like the attitude there i think google is much more friendly 
to developers. But the trade-off is that I feel like the average app quality on Google is probably lower than the average app quality on the average app quality on Google is lower than the average app quality on Apple. Right. No, I think it's it's interesting because I would almost say so I would say something similar but slightly different. Right. I think it's framing, and I and I would bet that this is a little bit of bias on both of our parts. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I think the culture ref definitely reflects in the third party ecosystem, uh, Google being open source, quick iteration. Uh, different rollout tracks, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like alpha, beta, yeah. right? You can have different tracks. Whereas on iOS, like you have this concept of test flight, which was an acquisition. It's like kind of taped together. It works semi-okay. And yeah. it, it's just clear that like quick iteration and all these different like alphas and betas and, and pre-release builds is like not really a thing. Mm -hmm. Apple's uh, kind of, their, their North Star is build something. It better follow the guidelines to the T it needs to be semi like, you know, good quality. Like you can't have, uh, you know, things that are not looking, you know, up to par in the UI. Things need to adapt to different devices as well. It's, it's very rigid. And I think it's really subjective whether or not that adds value. I think in the Apple base camp, right? People would say, well, it keeps like a common quality bar. Uh, you know, everyone has to follow these rules. Um, but, you know, a part of that is, does everybody follow those rules? I think it is a little subjective based on the reviewer that you do get. So um, I can speak a little to the review process. Apple's review process uh, randomizes, for obvious reasons, uh, the reviewer your, your app goes to. It's very secretive, um, but they do have a, you know, it, it's not necessarily a one size fits all. They go through the process and everybody handles it a little differently. And I've had experiences where submitting something to the app store that, you know, might not have been my finest work has gotten through very quickly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like it would get rejected for the dumbest of reasons, which I would, you know, not even consider valid in certain cases. What are your thoughts on um, the whole anti antitrust uh, bullhorn that's been, you know, the, the spotlight of tech news lately? Uh, particularly, let's start with uh, uh, commissions. So both Apple and Google, correct me if I'm wrong, have reduced uh, you know, App Store uh, cuts from 30% to 15%. I know Apple does something a little different for subscriptions, but what are your thoughts on uh, what the platforms provide and in turn the, the commission share as well as, you know, we talked about barrier to entry for the fees, you know, $25 one time, $100 recurring, uh, but the, the models in general, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is a super interesting Area, which I think we could talk about for a long time. I'll try and keep my thoughts concise here. So I think that, um, for, well, first off, the 15% reduction, I think that's only applicable for the first million dollars in revenue. Is that right? So like beyond yeah. that, it goes back to 30% cut. Yeah. Um, and I think that <clears throat> I think that's a really good step forward because like for people like indie developers who are just making apps on their own, a mm -hmm. lot of them will never even cross a million. So that's a huge amount of money back in their pocket because that 30% went out of 15%. So I think that's a really good sign. Yeah. Um, but I think here, here's the, the, like the takeaway for me is that that commission, that 30% cut or 15% cut is justified if the platform is providing that much value. And I feel like, especially back in the early days, they were providing a lot of value because they were gatekeepers to make sure like garbage apps got, didn't get um, into the store. There was some sort of uniformity in terms of like quality, like no malware, UI maybe. Um, and they were also really valuable in terms of like reaching people distribution that's huge right but yeah. i feel like now um like these platforms are so powerful like there's no possible third competitor like windows mobile died i'm pretty sure i don't even know if it's still around it died <laughs> it, it, there's no like competitor right and so i feel like um they're not doing that much work anymore like they're not actually offering that much value to to developers but they're still taking this exorbitant 30 percent fee um and so I feel like that gets into a state where like, you know, as these platforms become more and more powerful, they're going to become richer and richer, Apple and Google. And that leads to a kind of a troubling future where, you know, they're going to become, it'll be hard to really compete with them in the future because they're so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think the value proposition has changed over the past decade. Um, I also think, and I think this is partly political and strategic on, on both companies' parts. When you have larger companies, Epic, Fortnite, I'm pretty sure EA and other, other, other folks going to court uh, and you know Apple and Google can both turn around and say, hey, we offer 15% for the little guys, right? The, the case that these, these uh, the, you know, 
people being people suing them are making uh, don't really ha- hold up anymore, right? It's not hurting small quote unquote businesses anymore. It just makes all these other companies look like greedy fat cats at that yeah. point. So I, you know, it doesn't hurt these platform bottom lines very much uh, financially, but it definitely makes them look way better in the eye of the law. So yeah. I think it's interesting and I think time will tell. I think a lot of companies uh, are very fed up with the model. I do think the platforms provide, you know, something, whether or not that uh, is is enough to warrant 30% is, is, you know, very subjective. Um, you know, I think time will tell. Uh, speaking of just overall workflow and process, a pull request and feedback, uh, I wanted to drill and bug you a little bit about what it's like working as a mobile dev at Facebook, tooling, uh, just thoughts in general. I don't know how often you interact with iOS and maybe I can shed some light from the Microsoft perspective as well. Yeah, I'd love to hear about how Microsoft works, especially because I think Microsoft and Facebook are both huge companies. So I'll, I'll talk about the Android side of it, both from the Facebook bubble, like how it is to like operate in this huge company and also on my own. So I think on my own as like an in-develop, independent developer who makes tutorials and like publishes apps on my own, I feel like yep. the Android tooling has gotten significantly better since I started Android, you know, five, five or six years ago. Like Android Studio is significantly better the documentation and the, the like ADB, like the way to like check logs and all the um, debugging mechanism is so much better. I'm really happy, mm-hmm. about, happy about that. But when you think about um, Android at a big company, like my data point is Facebook and to some extent Pinterest, but I think this is actually across many companies. When you have a code base, which gets really, really big, yeah. um, you have all sorts of headache that comes with that. Like, so for example, um, the code base that I work on at work, you can't actually load all the modules of the project um, at once. And so like, you have to have this special tooling to tell Android Studio that here are the particular modules that you wanna load in at a particular time. And if, if that's linked to some code which is not loaded in, you're gonna have those red underlines saying, hey, I don't know how to resolve that reference. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of pain points that come with just having a huge code base and uh, like a huge number of developers who are all committing code every day. Like we have more than, I don't know the exact number, we have thousands and thousands of developers at a company like Facebook. And there's a lot of things that get, that start breaking when you get to that scale. Um, But overall, I think Android has done a pretty good job of like keeping up to date and improving year over year. Right. How how is that at uh, Microsoft and iOS overall? Yeah, yeah. I think you touched on basically every single point that I was going to touch on. Uh, But it's interesting to hear that, you know, Actually, it's funny when you're you're talking through the evolution of Android tooling. I remember when I first, um, a long time ago, I was interested in getting my feet wet with Android. And I remember, I don't think Android Studio was a thing. And I remember installing like Eclipse. And uh, there there was this thing for uh, Android virtual device emulators to like speed them up. And yeah, I mean, I I just, I just chuckle every time I hear people talk about the evolution because people that get into mobile now, like the world of mobile now and the world of mobile even five, six years ago is drastically different. Totally. Um, but yeah, so speaking to iOS at scale, and I think it's very similar to Android at scale, uh, modules, similar deal for iOS, right? I think once your project gets uh, big enough, right, you need different libraries, uh, you need to modularize your project, uh, if not for the sake of, of build times, uh, then for the sake of, you know, like you you don't necessarily need to be checking out uh, abs- exorbitant amounts of code when you're working on like one file in one particular module. Um, I don't know if you, for Android, if you guys also leverage Buck, but we do use, uh, you know, build systems, uh, Blaze, Bazel, which is the one by Google. I think Buck is very similar by Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do, you know, we do have tooling that we use to not only uh, build faster and cache, but I think you know, large projects come with the headache of just the sheer number of uh, lines of code at scale. Uh, but on top of that, maintaining quality across, you know, hundreds of developers checking into uh, one project and then thousands that are collaborating across other projects. And a big part of that is, is automation and testing, right? Having pipelines, uh, all different kinds of tests, unit, UI, snapshot. Um, and then on top of that, you know, there's this big policy of there's just like no such thing as like a QA engineer. Uh, you know, in theory, right? Like you got to be testing what, what, whatever is going in, um, you know, being stamped by you or being checked in by you. Mm. Uh, but on top of that, I think, you know, when, when you do collaborate, um, you do need to have a solid suite of tests to automate integration because, you know, you're, 
you can only test so many things in so much time and you're just not going to have enough time in the day to do it. Um, let's see, community wise, the iOS community at Microsoft is very close knit. There's a lot of collaboration. So people aren't solving the same problems over and over. A lot of open sourcing, both Objective-C and Swift. Um, you know, there's a big, the code base is particularly for Office is the one I'll speak to. PowerPoint, Excel, Word are enormous. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine that there's a lot of shared infra. So there, you know, it's in everyone's best interest to collaborate and share as much uh, technically, uh, but also know-how, right? In terms of, you know, what, what has worked, what might be somewhat on like the gray area with Apple that we should or shouldn't be doing, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of a nutshell how, how things are how things are handled here. Actually, you know, one thing I'm curious about in the context of big companies or like mid-sized or big companies, I think a lot of the people watching, they may want to one day work at, you know, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, these huge successful companies. Do you feel like, um, I'm curious if you have an opinion on if you think Android or iOS will be in more demand from a career perspective in the next couple no. of years? I think it's a good question. I think I have a, a big biased answer, but if I take a step back for a second and really think about it, I would say the quant, so I think it, I, it's gonna, I'm gonna say it depends, which is kind of a cop-out answer. Mm -hmm. But if I needed to give a concrete answer, I would say Android might have a uh, lower volume of demand, but higher volume in terms of seniority of that demand. Mm. Um, whereas I think for iOS, I think a lot of tendency, uh, especially startups and all these companies, larger companies that have these, you know, new projects that they want to spin up, which are what I think of as startups within like, you know, these big golden gates, uh, you know, they want to iterate quickly and move fast. And I think iOS people try to get a lot of validation on before, you know, moving over to Android. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen, you know, I've got a, a lot of good uh, friends and colleagues that, work in Android are very, very, very senior. Um, I think one of them, so one of them works over at Snapchat and they've had uh, you know, a long trek of improving their, their Snapchat Android client. And they you know, are in, in dire need of really senior, you know, top-notch Android engineers. Um, I think they have more iOS engineers and I don't know if that's by virtue of they build for us on iOS, but I don't know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I, I bet you my answer is very biased though. Yeah, no, I think, <laughs> It's so interesting how like we're coming in with our own biases and our own like you know our own uh, past history and influencing answers. I think yeah, like it, it, I, I feel like I have a little bit of a different perspective. I think that I, I agree with what you said about if you're a five person startup or you're getting off the ground in the U.S., yep. then almost always you're going to start with building an iOS app first because like we, what we talked about before, most of the u, uh, user base that's willing to actually pay and get you know like in the U.S. at least is going to be iOS dominant, and so mm -hmm. of course you want to start with iOS, but I do feel like if your objective is to work at larger companies, like not startups, then I think that there's going to be more growth um, in the world of Android compared to iOS. And the reason is because when you start to get to the scale of like Snapchat or Pinterest or Facebook, a lot of their user base, like you, the majority of their user base is international, right? Mm. And if you're targeting yep. international, now you're going to have a Android dominant user base. And because of the biases of like what we talked about, like the majority of the developers of these big companies are in like Bay Area, um, Silicon Valley, Microsoft, Amazon's in Seattle, and maybe some people in New York, right? But mm -hmm. like the majority of people are gonna be very iOS leaning. And so there has to be like a conscious effort from these big companies to recruit Android people. And so I really do feel like um, if your goal is to work at a big company, there is, in my opinion, uh, maybe a controversial take, but I think you're gonna be better suited to land a job at a big company if you do Android compared to iOS. Interesting. No, I think I, I do think that that perspective has merit, though, right? From a perspective of the business looking to adopt more growth, which is definitely international, the world doesn't end at the border of New York, um, as contrary to what many believe. Um, but no, I, I, th I think it's interesting. I guess uh, I'm curious to hear as a, as a quick follow up. Do you do you think a barrier to entry is more difficult for Android uh, at a larger company? Uh, maybe this is just by me being naive and you know a terrible Android developer, or do you think it's particularly uh, easier um, to be mentored and grow as an iOS developer? Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Um, I feel like yeah, it, it, my answer probably changes. I think now um, it's gotten better, like the tooling around 
Android makes you like ramp up faster. You can get more visibility to what your application is actually doing, how to load projects, like how things are connected. So I feel like that helps a lot. But I do agree with what, like a broader point that you're bringing up, which is that um, the way you do development at a company like Facebook is actually quite different from how you would do it if you have like a hello world app and you're starting from there, right? So um, yeah. I think that that is certainly something that like, you might be able to be a decent Android developer for a small project, but like the way you think about it and the way you make changes at a big company is actually quite different. But I think yeah. that that's not like insurmountable. I think that if you work hard and you actually mm -hmm. like spend time reading a lot of the code, and of course, you know, these big companies are really big on mentorship and they're really gonna try and have a manager or a mentor or a tech lead who supports you. Yeah. I think that most people, if they've been able to build an app on their own, they'll be able to, <clears throat> able to succeed at these big companies as well. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I think that goes back to the point of learning to learn, right? There's yeah, always exactly. going to be something to learn and grow. And I don't think any of it is impossible by any mean, yeah. uh, means. And I, and I, I would also, I'll, I'll toss in there, you know, developing iOS at scale is also very different than, you know, opening up Xcode and building a hello world yeah. uh, app, but uh, cool. So I think we're almost at time. Uh, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about um, content creation and what you and I both do on the side here. Um, so uh, for some of uh, some of the folks watching uh, here on my channel, they might know that this iOS Academy channel started in the dead middle of quarantine, uh, and it was a bunch of pretty cringeworthy tutorials. A lot of the tutorials are still cringeworthy, but uh, hopefully a little less than a year ago. Uh, and yeah, this is kind of how uh, this channel has, has started to grow and now it's continuing to grow. So I know we're short on time. So um, any, any quick thoughts to toss in? Uh, I know we can possibly break this up and there might be a little banner here or here for folks to jump on over to your channel to check out that piece. Yeah, and I think the topic of, you know, how Android and iOS developers approach their career and especially like in the next five years, what changes we anticipate as someone as people who've been doing this for a long time, I think hopefully a lot of people will get value out of it. If people have questions, um, you know, the tech career growth community that I mentioned is, is yep. a great place. I'm happy to help out. I know Afraz is part of that as well. So yep. um, it's been really fun to kind of meet interesting people uh, through that. And yeah, I think the content creation part is also something that I, I care a lot about. We both care a lot about, obviously, because we spent a lot of time doing that. So I'm really excited to go over on my channel and, and record that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll plug it again. So Tech Career Growth, I'll drop a link down below. I am a member of it. I silently creep on all the posts that go in there. Uh, I'll subtly start to poke people more in there and, and toss in my two cents. But uh, yeah, definitely check it out. Link down below. Drop a like if you haven't done so yet. Subscribe to the channel if you're into iOS, Swift, tech in general. A lot more tech-related videos uh, coming in the next weeks. Thanks again for watching, everyone. And I uh, hope to see you on Rahul's channel, also linked down below. And the video should be popping up right here or here. Thanks again for watching, guys. All right. Bye, guys. Thanks.